very excited for our webinar today featuring Dr. Francesca Lopez. Dr. Lopez is a Waterbury Chair in Equity Pedagogy and Professor of Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at Penn State. She's a past recipient of Division 15's Early Career Grant and has since been awarded major grants to the American Educational Research Association, the Spencer Foundation, the Institute of Educational Sciences, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Her research focuses on asset-based pedagogy, exploring the types of knowledge educators need to promote the identity and achievement of marginalized youth. Her work has been published in a variety of outlets, such as the Journal of Teacher Education, Educational Policy, and Contemporary Educational Psychology. We'd like to thank the division for providing us with the subscription to Mentimeter to make this a more interactive experience. To participate, you can use a smartphone or open up your tab on your computer and go to menti.com using the code 53254526. Jason Chen will also put the code into the chat if you would like to just copy paste it in. Dr. Lopez will be using Mentimeter throughout her presentation as well as the final Q&A. So rather than put the questions into the chat, we ask that you wait until the end to submit them through Mentimeter. This webinar is being recorded and will later be posted to Division 15's website. Welcome, Dr. Lopez. Thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today and excited that you're all gonna go on this journey with me with Menti. It's supposed to be very fun and interactive. Um, so it should help us keep things going. I'll, I'm kind of waiting to make sure everybody's on there. So 5325 or 526, it should go ahead and ask you for that code. And you will see my slides progress. And then when it's time to answer a question, that should show up either on your, on your phone screen or, or on the computer that you're using. So with that, equity pedagogy, creating classrooms where all children thrive. So I wanted us to start right away um, and just think about a few words that to you describe equity pedagogy. So using menti.com, go ahead and enter um, whatever it is that you're thinking of when you see that word or when you hear that term. So meeting the diverse needs of students, a level playing field, being inclusive, giving equal opportunities to learn, learning that's accessible, accessible inclusion, we see social justice, uh, delivering instruction to all, no matter their demographic, knowledge of how to be equal to all students. These are great, these are great. So we're seeing some patterns as they scroll up teaching practices that enable all students to feel motivated and safe in the classroom, helping all students feel seen, developmentally appropriate, culturally relevant, these are fantastic. And yes, all of those would definitely fall under the umbrella of equity pedagogy, right? So before I go into equity pedagogy, we have to kind of discuss this elephant in the room because of what's been going on nationally in terms of the anti-critical race theory discourse that all of us probably, right, have heard something about. And so, at this point, we're at 28 states that have tried to restrict education on racism, bias, and the contributions of specific racial or ethnic groups, right, to US um, history or related topics. So we have to really delve into that before we talk about equity pedagogy. And so I thought it would be helpful to just describe very briefly what critical race theory is, since this is the term that's being used to encapsulate equity pedagogy at the moment. And so for anyone who is not aware, right, it was born out of this body of scholarship in the 1970s by legal scholars that included Derek Bell, who's known as the father of CRT, Richard Delgado, and many others to examine how racism produces and sustains inequality, right? And so as an example of what that meant in the legal field, Ian Haney Lopez, who happens to be a former student of Derek Bell's, used CRT to examine a case, a Supreme Court case, Hernandez versus Texas, to examine how race was being used as subordination and how that is protected by the Constitution, right? So it came to us in education, thanks to William Tate and Gloria Latson Billings in 1995. And since then, we've seen many, many researchers in education engage critical race theory, looking at issues of inequality, right, in education. And in our very own field, we have Dr. Jessica Dixier Gumby, right, who has used CRT and is one of the leaders in our field, right, in using CRT with educational psychology. So it's not brand new to, to EdPsych. So a question I have for you all that you'll see on your screen 
and that I'd like for you to answer yes, no, not sure, is critical race theory being taught in K-12 classrooms? So the answers are coming in. The not sure is edging up with the no a little bit. Okay, so this is this is great. Please keep entering your, your answers. Um, technically, far and wide in K-12, the answer is no. Critical race theory does tend to be a topic, a theory that we see in grad school. And for those of us who went through education programs, like very few of us get exposed to critical race theory. In legal studies, very few people get exposed to critical race theory. That said, it may happen that you happen to have a teacher who knows the theory and might engage it, but far and wide, absolutely not. We really are not seeing critical race theory being taught in K-12, right? So what we've seen and what got us here is we have Christopher Rufo, who works for the Manhattan Institute. It's a think tank, a very conservative think tank, who is very open and transparent about the strategy he engaged and bragged a bit, right, that he had helped successfully freeze our brand, right, or the left's brand, critical race theory into public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. And as we all know, because we've now heard of the anti-CRT, they were very successful in creating a setting where everything fell under the CRT umbrella and in a discussion I had with the superintendent, they said, it doesn't matter if it isn't really CRT, this is how people know it. They know it as CRT, so it's falling under that umbrella. And so what we've also seen is propaganda go out by various think tanks where we, and this was directed to school leaders. When parents hear terms like equity, anti-racism, cultural competence, culturally responsive, you all can read the rest, they would fundamentally be correct to go to a school board meeting and complain about critical race theory. All of these practices are influenced by and have the same politicized purpose and so on, right? So much of the propaganda that's coming out of these think tanks is geared toward families and telling them if a school leader is telling you they are not engaged in CRT, they are gaslighting you, right? So why did we get here? Why are we where we are today, right? CRT is one of those things that if we were to look at the Google metrics was a flat line and then all of a sudden it skyrocketed and we started hearing about it on news networks. We're seeing it everywhere. And so why is it being targeted requires a little bit of understanding historically of how we got to now um, and then going deeper into the present time and, and what we're seeing unfold right now. So starting with the brief history, Horace Mann, right? If we think of one of the names or the name that we pinpoint to say this was really the the point and the person and the idea who gave us the the current version of what we see in terms of public schools right it was his vision his influence to say we need a common schooling um, to be able to address the fact that we have so many different immigration groups and so that we have an educated population and after what happened in january 6th the reading by Kremen that has much of man's writings um, is pretty, pretty important to read again because he could not have predicted something as well as he did, right, as what we lived in January 6th. So in the 1920s and 1940s, we had Harold Rugg and what I love about Harold Rugg, a couple of things, but he was an educational psychologist. Um, he was trained as an educational psychologist. He worked with Thorndike on assessments but his profession, he really became a curricular theorist. So even though he had the ed psych background, he engaged in writing books that were explicitly focused on social justice. So in the 20s and 40s, he had texts called Man and His Changing Society that were centered on the development of critical judgment, reflexive thinking, and self-expression. But a group came out and accused him of undermining patriotism, stressing the errors and evils in our civilization, belittling and maligning America, debunking our great heroes of the past, and generally subversive, un-American, and communist. All of which these themes should be sounding very familiar because they are just like what we're hearing with anti-CRT, right? And here we are back in the, as early as the 20s. So then we had the McCarthy era, right? Where we had 
the accusation that teachers were, were poisoning the minds of school children with thoughts and ideas of socialism and communism. They were considered traitors in the classroom where some teachers even had to sign loyalty oaths and were told they could not discuss controversial issues or would be dismissed. Again, some things we're seeing very similar in many, many states. And then we have this era of, of Brown versus the Board of Education, the civil rights and the war on poverty, where it seems like we're making some movement toward true structural changes in many ways, um, but yet these undertow forces were still totally alive and well, right? So during the civil rights movement, the FBI surveillance of figures like Malcolm X, um, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, all of whom were considered communists, right? So we still have these forces and accusations of some of the leaders of social justice in our history. And we see this also with sex education that came soon after this, right? Where you look at the highlighted area on the screen, facts didn't matter. Culture war, as the right had learned, could thrive on conspiracy and half-truths. What mattered wasn't facts, but fear, right? So if new morality is affirmed, our children will become easy targets for Marxism and immoral nihilistic philosophies, right? So this was part of what Richard Nixon sees, declaring that he would not allow the effort to control and eliminate, right? He wanted to eliminate smut from our national life, even though there had been a lot of political momentum in actually including sex education in our schools. The next point in history, absolutely critical, 1971, where Lewis Powell authors what becomes known as the Powell Memo. So before he became a Supreme Court justice, he wrote about how the American system was under broad attack. And you all could probably Google it and find it and verbatim, everything he called for in that memo is alive and well in the forces that we see today that have pushed the anti-LGBTQ movements, the anti-CRT movements. And so this is part of the text in his memo. We've seen the civil rights movement insist on rewriting many of the textbooks in our universities and schools. A return to a more rational balance is needed to counter these communists and new leftists. The media, intellectual journals, and other outlets need to have funding of conservative think tanks and more political involvement by corporations. So here we are at present, right? Where corporations are people and drive so much of the reform that we see. So very soon after we come into the era of Reagan, right? And this is a key moment in history because his strategist, right, Lee Atwater, comes out in an interview. It's accessible to anybody. They recorded it. And this is an excerpt where he talks about what is then known as the Southern strategy where you can start out in 1954 by saying all these racial slurs, but by 1968, right after the, the civil rights movements engaged, you really can't say that. It hurts you, it backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' right, all that stuff. You're getting abstract now. You're talking about cutting taxes and all these things you're talking about are totally economic things. And a byproduct of them is blacks get hurt, hurt worse than whites. Right, so he is talking about a strategy that we are seeing play out to this very day. That since the appointment, well, the, the election of Reagan, right, we've seen many of these forces play out, including where we find ourselves with the cutting of public school funding, where the deep professionalization of teaching, it goes on and on and on, right? All of this can be pinned to that Southern strategy. And perhaps no one has looked at this more in depth than Ian Haney Lopez. Um, in his book, Dog Whistle Politics, he details the history of this strategy that he really talks about it in the sense of this core narrative, right? This is the strategy in three parts. First, you feel fear and resentment of people of color. Then you feel the distrust of government. And then the third one is that you trust free market approaches. So this is the three pronged strategy, right? That he names Dog Whistle Politics. So one clear example of fueling fear and resentment, we can see here in this tweet where he talks, Christopher Rufo talks about critical race theory is driving public education and must be stopped. And the images are whiteness is a bad deal, right? So he's very directly engaging a fear that white children are going to be made to feel guilty. In fact, we've seen much of that discourse that white children are gonna be the targets of critical race theory. 
In terms of distrust of government, we're seeing a lot of propaganda that says a guide to long-term strategic thinking for parents, right? Parents fighting CRT are making a flawed assumption that the government entities to which they appeal are responsive, right? Very direct link between that and the distrust of government. And then the third, third one, trust the free market. That's what will solve all of this. So instead of learning CRT, students should know about their own schools measuring up. And if not, they should be able to choose to go to a different school, right? All based on these fundamental free market approaches. And so what we're seeing now in terms of this effort to restrict teaching about racism is a force that we are faced with because there have been more efforts, right? To teach about racism and bias. And so when we think about that, the question that I'd like for you all to answer is, as of right now, should teachers teach about race and racism in K-12 classrooms? So far we have a unanimous set of yeses. And this looks like pretty much everybody saying yes. That's awesome. And that is the right answer. <laughs> for, for those of you that are not sure, I just saw some people pop up with not sure. Wonderful. I'm going to cover this because this is a climate where there is a lot of misinformation, but definitely should teachers teach about race? The research tells us yes, but they need to be equipped to do it, right? So if they're not equipped, then perhaps they shouldn't deal with it because they may do more harm. So this next question, um, each one of you has a little icon. You can use your real name if you want to use your real name. You can use the name aside to you, assigned to you if you want to use it. You will have 20 seconds to answer this next question once it pops up on the screen. So I'm going to move ahead to the actual question. And the quicker you get it, the more points you get, and there will be a leaderboard. So what percentage of children ages six to 11 think people in the US are treated unfairly based on race. Okay. Oh, wow, this is great. Almost a normal curve. And the one that was at the end, the answer is 86. So for the vast majority of us here today, this was it should be shocking, right? 86% of children ages six to 11 think that race is an issue. So we have here the leaderboard. Um, Tom is leading <laughs> with 940 points. Thank you for playing. Um, so this came from a Sesame Workshop research study that actually identified children between the ages of six to 11 and their parents. And of the children, 86% felt that no, people are not treated fairly. And the vast majority of those children also identified as black, right? So we have young children in our nation, part of this study, that are aware that people are treated differently based on race. And we know through research that children are very aware of stereotypes. And if they're members of a stereotyped group, they become aware even earlier than the average child, right? This understanding can prevent a sense of belonging and undermine their academic achievement. So these negative biases and stereotypes can have numerous negative outcomes um, for all students. And evidence points to this need to help youth counteract biases that they can form. And we all form them, by the way, we all form cognitive biases. And so they actually need help to help counteract these biases that they form based on stereotypes. And to counter them, research suggests that we really need teachers explicitly promoting social belonging, right? They need to know how to do that in a way that centers race. Um, and so why is this important? A lot of the discourse out there is, no, we should leave that at home. Parents should be the ones socializing their children. And although parents are indeed an important source of racial and ethnic socialization for youth, educators are the ones that play a fundamental and influential role. And this is particularly important because many families, especially if they are white families, do not engage in discussions of race, racism and stereotypes with their children, right? And there's evidence that suggests that if we just ignore students' awareness of race, racism, and stereotypes, we actually promote prejudice by not engaging on that topic in the classroom. So I want to get a sense of, of everyone's ideas on why have we seen this increased focus on equity in education, right? As educational psychologists, maybe a decade ago, 
we were not seeing as much as we are today in terms of equity, culturally relevant practices and so on. So if you would just enter why you think this is the case. So we see more activists movements realizing that there's different needs of students. More activist movement, social media exposure. Riots, people becoming aware of it and bringing it to light, the browning of America, demographic shifts, um, more mass media, failure of a colorblind approach, increased public scrutiny of policing, an increase in visible social inequity due to things like social media, so it's important to talk about, increased awareness of racism, uh, killing of George Floyd, and I'm guessing it's, and pandemic shined a light on it. More, in, more individuals from underrepresented populations, lack of change, we still have achievement gaps. All of these are wonderful answers. Growing uh, awareness, better awareness. Excellent, these are fantastic answers. Thank you all. So there are two main pretty huge forces and much of them right, were touched on by your answers. So the one that I wanna prime first is we have this pretty robust body of scholarship that is pointed to the fact that educators more often than not do not have the specific knowledge and skills that they need to address achievement disparities in educational contexts. So this key knowledge is something that many teachers just don't get, it's not part of their program. The second component that intersected with this is this response to mounting racial tensions, right? Particularly after the murder of George Floyd. So collectively not having sufficient educators with this knowledge and skills and this watershed moment to respond to disparities are both key factors in why we started seeing what we started seeing. So if we turn to educational psychology research, right? We, we have a pretty deep body of literature that has shown us how teacher expectations inform their behaviors, how that in turn informs many facets of students' identity and that that in turn is important, right? Because of the student outcomes that they predict. The issue we've had is that we know that as much as teachers might want to have high expectations, something interferes with them being able to sustain them. So my question to you is what interferes with teachers' expectations? What gets in the way of high expectations? We're seeing bullying, family dynamics, belonging, politics, bias, parents, implicit bias, student family dynamics, lack of empathy. Okay, we see one staying kind of big there. The big one, this is the perfect audience, right? The big one is bias, implicit bias, absolutely. Politics, parents play a role in those things. Um, and there's many others. This is great. Fantastic. Yep. So bias, that's a huge one, right? Myth of meritocracy, that's another one. Excellent. So yes, it's implicit biases that prevent any one of us, right? Because of the force that, again, they're not conscious, they're implicit. So the, they're gonna affect the expectations teachers have of their students. And if they aren't aware of how to undo those biases, they're gonna continue doing what they're doing, right? And we're gonna continue to see the achievement disparities that, we, that we've seen out there. So the question then is, well, how do we address these implicit biases that we know are so detrimental to everybody's outcomes? And we know that pretending like race doesn't matter, perpetuating the notion that educators don't see you know, color just sustains racism in schools. And we've even seen, um, so Gloria Latin Billings has often used Sesame Street as an example of, a perfect example of culturally relevant um, pedagogy, right? And so we have seen that Sesame Street in a lot of its instruction tries to deal with the kind of things that we need to counter the biases we otherwise form through illustrating depictions, through giving information and so on. And so all this knowledge, this essential knowledge I keep talking about is known as teacher critical consciousness. Sometimes it's known as critical awareness, but it's knowledge that is needed to be able to counter the things that we otherwise continue the status quo. Right, so 
in, in a nutshell, essential knowledge, critical consciousness involves three big things. One is the understanding of the historical context of marginalized students, right? Students and we are not socialized in a vacuum. There is a legacy and a history that informs the now. And so understanding history and understanding what happened generations prior is absolutely critical to developing critical consciousness. And a lot of times this helps us see that the schooling that we see serves some students very well, but continues to marginalize other students. It's also knowledge that gives us an understanding of the discrepancy between whose experiences are validated in classrooms and the traditional curriculum and whose are not, which is very important for identity development. And we also come to understand how the curriculum that we see in schools simply replicates the very disparities that we see in society, right? So this is a very broad view of the kind of knowledge that is needed. Some scholars have said, you know, it's knowledge of civil rights movements, laws, history. It's a lot of stuff that many of us do not get in our programs, whether we're trained to be teachers, leaders, or educational psychologists. And so with this critical consciousness in the research I've done, it helps sustain high expectations because there is this knowledge that can counter the implicit biases. And we know that this knowledge then allows teachers to engage in asset-based behaviors that affirms students' identity, whether it's their academic identity, their ethnic identity, and we know collectively these things are very important for the achievement outcomes that we want to see, right, altogether. And so just to kind of mine um, the terms that you're aware of, what words or phrases come to mind when you read asset-based pedagogy or you see equity, anti-racism, or social justice? What are the phrases that come to mind, especially when we're talking pedagogy? Growth mindset, equal, fair, okay, even, finally. Equal opportunity, we don't matter. Interest convergence, culturally relevant. Strengths, yeah. Cultural wealth, all of us, not some of us, I love that. Progress, so you can see fair and equal are the, are the bigger words of, of the two, I, of the many that are up on the screen. These are great, culturally sensitive, equity, not equal. The reason why I asked you is to prime, you know, the terminology that we often see. And I saw one, I saw culturally relevant pedagogy. And we actually have quite a few, and, and there's a reason I suspect, right, that we didn't see many more of these others that you see on the screen now. And that's because they really haven't been part of the lexicon in educational psychology. But there is a long history of asset-based pedagogy that includes James Banks' version of multicultural education, ethnic studies, bilingual education even. Um, and you can see more of the, the more contemporary terms like culturally sustaining pedagogies cultural connectedness, right? All of these engage the diagram I showed earlier that certain knowledge is needed for teachers to engage in certain practices that are supposed to inform identity and, and outcomes. And so these terms largely haven't really been part of the discourse in educational psychology. Um, and one other point I'd like to make is earlier when I asked is CRT actually happening in schools and largely the answer is no. One issue I want to bring is that even though asset pedagogy and practice and policy are not critical race theory, they just are not, they actually do share two of CRT's aims, which is one, to understand and identify the sources of longstanding racial disparities in education. And with that understanding, then engage in action, right? By creating the conditions for access to learning opportunities in schools. And so what does the evidence say about this? And so overall, and, and some of the research I've carried out, for example, we know that the more policies have a focus on asset-based. So things like being pro-bilingual education instead of anti-bilingual education, just as an example. Um, practices that engage teachers' knowledge, right? Policies in terms of certification versus those that don't have them engage in, in certain courses. 
more and more we know that the more asset-based it is, the more we see better outcomes for both teachers in terms of retaining teachers, keeping teachers in the classroom, and also for students. This is also true for asset-based practices. The more teachers engage in asset-based practices, we know through a lot of scholars, not just the, the citations that I have on the screen, we see better outcomes. So this is really about engaging in practices that ensure every child thrives, not just some children thrive. And so when I talk about outcomes, there are many that I'm referring to. This is not an, a total list, right? Academic self-concept is one, ethnic identity, curiosity, self-direction, the motivation and desire to learn about others. So I, I make that point because anti-CRT movements claim that this is trying to counter the anti-white um, push that culturally relevant, relevant or CRT pushes. And this is absolutely not true. When we see asset-based pedagogy, and this includes ethnic studies, we see youth want to learn more about other cultures, not less. So it's quite the opposite of, of what's being spread in terms of propaganda. And so I wanted, since this was pretty dense in terms of information, to stop here and answer any questions you might have, engage in discussion, and we have plenty of time for Q&A. So the question right now, how can interventions be implemented to support asset-based pedagogy and CRT? Um, this is a really wonderful question. And the issue with interventions is that the research should suggest to us that interventions focused explicitly on implicit bias, unfortunately, are not very effective. By and large, um, in a meta-analysis, no, I'm sorry, it was a synthesis. It was not a meta-analysis. Um, a, a synthesis that was carried out found there were only two key factors in these kinds of interventions that showed positive outcomes. Those included one sustained, which means it wasn't a sit and get one and done situation, but rather one where teachers were engaged over and over and over, over the course of at least say six months, um, and that it was iterative. They kept engaging in those practices actually in the classroom so that they were implementing what they were learning. And getting that kind of buy-in is difficult. So these interventions to implement and support these kinds of practices needs administrator buy-in, it needs people who are willing, right, to do it. And part of that is our job to disseminate evidence to show this is important and why it's important, right? So that, that's just one. There's a new issue um, that was co-edited by Jessica DeCure Gumby, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who else was in there. Deleon Gray has a piece in there, Repti Kumar has a piece in there that looks explicitly at um, biases and those are definitely worth looking into because the more we understand of, of what's working and how implicit biases can be reduced, um, the better off we are. And I don't know if I can see the next question. Mark is answered, there we go. So what are some examples of asset-based practices. So in the um, abstract, they are in all those terms I, I showed earlier, like multicultural education, funds of knowledge. Okay, that's in the abstract. Explicit examples would include, you know, to engage on the strengths students have, we need to understand how very often we see differences as deficits. Right, so I'll give you one example in terms of language because it's, it's I think, a, a clear way to, to paint this picture. If we see a student who does not speak English as lacking English, right, that's a deficit. We're viewing them as somebody that does not have something. If we shift that to consider, they are going to be bilingual because they already speak another language and they're gaining English. And we learn how to navigate, right, and meet them where they are, that would require, right, that a teacher then engage in understanding how does another language get acquired? What are the best practices to make sure that we know how to engage that student, right? A lot of times it requires additional knowledge. Another one um, in terms of an example is getting to know students. So culturally relevant pedagogy is wonderful in terms of explaining 
that it has to be relevant to the students. It has to capture what's interesting to them, what they're listening to, what is relevant. I mean, the, the language is right there. And it's incorporating that into instruction and valuing that the students are seen and that the knowledge that they come with to the classroom is used as a legitimate means to acquiring other means of whether it's English language arts, mathematics, science. So asset-based is viewing the strengths students come in with and using those strengths to build on instruction. Um, do you know of any strategies or resources that could be used when talking to a parent who might misunderstand some of these concepts? So I'm glad this question came up um, because the misunderstanding is very real. And, and I was mentioning to, to David and, and Jason, as well as Wade earlier, that one of the part twos of today's webinar is understanding how can we engage in messaging in such a way that we can turn people on to this knowledge rather than feel overwhelmed. So the messaging research out there tells us that there are individuals who are very aware of the propaganda and their intent behind that, right? So that's that core narrative, people who are engaging in the core narrative. But there's a much larger group of individuals, and in this case, I would say many educators and many families who want to know more but feel absolutely overwhelmed by what they're seeing on the news, in social media. And there is research that suggests to us what we should not be doing. So for those of us on Twitter, for example, we should not be sarcastic. Um, we should not be using the language that is part of the propaganda because that elevates that language. And we know that that is the message that is gonna stay on people's minds. Um, there are many don'ts, right? And I'm happy to share that resource. It's, a, it's an open source resource that I'll be sure to share along with the PowerPoint slides. But there are also many do strategies. One is we need to learn how to stay on message in a way that the message is positive, right? So if we step back and we think about what is the core reason asset-based pedagogy matters? And it is to ensure that every single child, right, has an opportunity to thrive. We want them to be seen. We want them to be validated. We want them to have all the things we know they need to have motivation, to engage in, in rigorous content. And so the strategies in terms of how do we do this, talking to parents, it's very important, one, that if they do come to us with fears is to ask questions, clarifying questions. What are you hearing? What are you worried about? Have you found out of an incident, right, where, where X, Y, Z happened? So having a genuine interest in finding out what the source of the anxiety, because many times it is going to be anxiety that families have, and this is something that has been validated by superintendents and, and others who are in this um, current dilemma of having families demand to know whether they're teaching CRT or not, right? Asking, seeing them also as coming from a place of, I'm worried about my child. Um, other than that is not, again, like I said, don't use the, the language of the other group, but painting the positive picture. And so those two things along with the evidence, I think is very powerful for families um, to understand. We know children understand race. We know the evidence says that if we pretend that it doesn't exist, we actually increase prejudice and do the opposite of engaging in student belonging practices. So those strategies are things that we need to practice because for any of us in social media, a lot of us tend to fall in the do not category in terms of the things that we're doing because we're incensed by what's going on. That is going to preach to the choir it's not gonna change hearts and minds, right? There are ways to get people to open up and, and listen to the evidence. The next question is what can we do to further convince parents that CRT isn't being taught? What sources would you share? So this question, similar to the one prior, um, I'm gonna share the resource on how to convince parents but the one thing those resources tell us is we should not say we are not teaching CRT. Um, there's many reasons for that. Some of it deals with the research of what works and what doesn't. 
um, which is we don't say no, this term is not being taught when they've engaged and co-opted that term. But early on, I shared information with you all on um, some of the propaganda that's going out there. And many of us, I'm guilty of this, before I saw the messaging research, was going out of my way to make it clear that teachers don't have the knowledge, more likely than not, to be able to teach CRT. So I was using evidence, but I was saying CRT is not really what's being taught. The evidence says we should not do that. To convince parents is, well, the strategies we use in our classrooms are to make sure every student is validated, every student is seen. Because along with this CRT propaganda, we're seeing, we're seeing stories that somebody did a white privilege lesson and now my child feels less than and, and is, is crying. Some of it many times is fabricated because they are talking points that we're seeing in a lot of spots. Um, there are reports from school board meetings that the people talking about CRT at those school board meetings do not even have children at the school, right? But this is all channeling down to the families that are then scared and don't know what to do, right? And so I will share the resource with messaging because it's very explicit on this is what we do. But if, if the key takeaway were anything, it's we focus on what we are doing and we focus on positive imagery, right? That our vision is to ensure every child in every classroom is seen, heard, validated, and given the tools they need to succeed. Um, the next question, how would you approach teaching undergraduate pre-service teachers about asset-based pedagogy? Luckily, there are scholars out there who are absolute experts on how to do this. And I can tell you, um, Refti Kumar has written quite a bit about this. She has a piece in 2013, co-authored with Hammer. So um, Kumar and Hammer 2013, where social justice focused courses um, are very important and help reduce biases is the way I would interpret that. But one course is not enough, right? It's kind of like when I started my career, um, all our ed psych books, when I was teaching child development or whatever it was that I was teaching, had culture at the end of, of the text, right? This, the same kind of thinking that goes into teacher training or undergraduate coursework cannot leave these things in silos. It has to become part of everything that is taught. So for teaching undergraduate teachers about asset-based pedagogy, I mentioned some of those things that are the essential knowledge, right? They need a course that covers history, politics, um, civil rights movement, assimilation for indigenous students. Um, the kind of things that we saw with Brown v. Board that we do know, but also the things we don't know, right? For example, with Brown v. Board, the power of hiring was given to white school districts and this resulted in about 40,000 plus teachers, black teachers being fired. Right? Many of us don't know that about Brown v. Board. So approaching teaching in a way that develops that critical consciousness is the way to get teachers to really learn about asset-based pedagogy. Because once you develop that critical consciousness, you can identify what the curriculum is missing. You can see how you can infuse your students into what otherwise wouldn't be there. Right? Please comment on the role that classroom assessment and external testing obstructs asset-based pedagogy. This is a fabulous um, statement um, to ask me to comment on it. So we know, and, and I'll, I'm gonna use an anecdote. I know we're not supposed to use anecdotes, but you know we're talking about CRT. So I am using a narrative from my own experience and that is valid, right? I was a teacher. I started out in third grade as a teacher bilingual teacher in Texas. And George Bush was our governor at that time. And we know that what he developed in Texas with the assessment became No Child Left Behind, right? That's the relevance there. I had eight-year-olds in my classroom who had to pass an assessment by the end of the year, um, or they would not be promoted to the next. It didn't matter what else they did. It didn't matter if we had done portfolios. It didn't matter that, that they were gifted in some other areas. If they did not pass the math and reading and in fourth grade it was writing, they would not be promoted to the next grade, right? So what I saw in my classroom was 
eight-year-olds chewing up their pencils, completely nervous, sick before this, because of this high stakes situation. So I say that and I share that with you all. I'm sure many of you have similar or worse or, or other stories, right? Um, we know that summative assessments narrow the curriculum because it becomes particularly in, in settings, right? Where there's more poverty, where we happen to have more children of color, not always. We have many areas where we have children in poverty and they are white, um, where we have a context where all that is taught is whatever will be on the test. So we actually cheat them of other knowledge, right? And in this case, how do you create an asset-based practice? Where do you see cultural relevance or students' voices? And so classroom assessment is one of those things that many scholars have been pushing against um, for many, many reasons, some of which I've already mentioned, but one of them is that it runs completely counter right, to asset-based pedagogy. Now, I've said all of that. However, um, there is a role for assessment. There is a role for understanding what students know. And I would argue that most of the people whose names was next to one of those asset-based pedagogies has written at one time or another, don't confuse, right? culturally relevant pedagogy or ethnic studies for meaning watered down curriculum or meaning not these other things because what they share is that what students must learn is what they term language of power they must succeed academically and they're not apologetic about that at all right so there is a role of assessment what becomes damaging and dangerous is when everything is narrowed the way we've seen after No Child Left Behind, where schools are then graded and punished if they are not meeting certain things, because it doesn't account for all the other ways children can demonstrate mastery of something, right? Um, so yes, it's been a huge emphasis that has derailed many of the efforts. Um, and what we are seeing now more and more is how do we create and engage asset-based assessments that point to the strengths students have, and even more importantly, right, that elevate their voice, that show us what students feel or think or believe based on what they've learned, right? Um, so yes, I, I think that's my comment, and I'm sure I could talk at length about it more and engage in discussion with many of you on this particular topic. Um, the next question is, did you anticipate that the current anti-CRT movement in K-12 will have an impact on teacher preparation programs, policies, and practices? This is a provocative question um, because I know it absolutely could, we, um, in my own research, I've seen how policies inform, right, the kind of requirements we see in higher education to be in, a, in alignment. In this particular case, however, uh, I do not believe, and I hope I'm right, uh, that this will be the case because in a lot of ways, this is a policy of distraction. Anti-CRT is not real. It, it, it's having real effects, but those of you in, in today's webinar who know what CRT is, know, right, that what is going on in schools is not CRT. What are they shutting down? They're shutting down and trying to rewrite history so that a, a prettier picture of the United States is painted, so that, you know, all the events we were seeing with the taking down of monuments toward colonizers, toward people who were on the wrong side of history, right, were taken down. And so what we're seeing right now is a concerted effort by a sm very small group of politicians who we can trace back into history of using the same strategies over and over to move their agenda, right? Their agenda for many, many years before Reagan uh, was largely considered radical, didn't really play a big role, but we're seeing it alive and well today in a lot of the choice, um, free market type of things that we're seeing in schools. In this particular case, I mean, we have to remember teacher preparation programs, 
people who work in higher education are targets of this type of group. We're considered too liberal. We are being accused of indoctrinating students, right? It, it's all of what was in Powell's memo. So I don't anticipate that this current movement is going to really affect teacher preparation. I think it's, it's doing what it intended. And what we're seeing is families, right, take their children out of school. I think we're seeing um, politicians say, well, we're gonna use voucher funds so that parents can have choice and those that want CRT get it and those that don't want it, don't get it, right? So I hope I'm right. I, I hope I'm not wrong about that question. Um, the next question is, how does asset-based pedagogy relate to anti-deficit thinking in post-secondary education? It seems to me that not all professors believe all students are assets to the classroom. I agree with whoever wrote this. Um, it's absolutely true. We know in some disciplines in particular, there is a weeding out that occurs. It's heavily in STEM, not only STEM, but we can see it in the demographics, right? Of who actually makes it across. And, and we definitely see it's language I've, I've heard used for K-12 where it's students don't drop out, they're pushed out. And I think we could argue the very same thing happens in, in secondary, I mean, post-secondary education, right? No, not all professors believe students are assets, but I wanna remind us that those of us in education, many of us were not ever trained on how to be pedagogues. We were not trained the ways that some of the teachers we see in K-12 settings were trained. So I think, Asset-based pedagogy is absolutely critical to higher education, but I think we see it even less than we see it in, in K-12. And some of that is informed by, by facts and what we see, and some of it is my opinion. I just want that disclaimer there. Um, but thank you for that question. I mean, it, it is an issue. And there have been scholars who push um, more asset-based pedagogy into higher education, Cecilia, Rios Aguilar from UCLA used funds of knowledge in higher education as one example, but it doesn't happen enough, right? We, we definitely need more of it. How can we educate people about these issues given the amount of money, effort, airtime that has been given to de demonizing CRT and all of the things that have been lumped under that umbrella? This is very difficult. Um, part of the how do we educate people, again, I will share in the, the research-based messaging strategies that, that we should all be engaging in. Money, effort, so, you know, a lot of this propaganda is coming from the same sources, right? Heritage Foundation is one of the big think tanks that pushes this continuously. Um, Cato Institute is another one of these entities, but we have to remember, right? Yes, money, much of it dark money, is funneled into these think tanks who then crank out all these pieces that then get disseminated and we tend to see them. When, when we see airtime, let's be very clear, the airtime largely is Fox News. There are, certain, um, there are certain names we can associate with this kind, when we're talking propaganda, right? We're not talking AP reporting where it could be factual, but rather a spin and somebody's opinion. Um, so yes, there's a lot of demonizing, but I, I do want to point out that it's trying to rile up people who are confused and create misunderstanding, but in the spaces I've been in, um, particularly those that are K-12 spaces, I, I would say even higher education, these folks are a minority. Um, they are not, a, a, they're very loud, right, and they have rallied and gotten a lot of attention, but when I've sat through some of these meetings, the vast majority of people understand that these are the, some things need to be done in education for equity. So again, it's how do we educate people about these issues? We need to be strategic. I've heard people say things like on social media, rather than saying we're not teaching CRT, we should be elevating CRT. Fundamentally, I agree with that statement, but if we are researchers and we rely on evidence to tell us how we should do things, the evidence says that when we do that, we are not turning the tide around, right? And so to me is, if our goal is to get people to understand, then we need to rely on the evidence that tells us this is how we get people to understand. Knowing there's about 10% of people we will never be able to 
to get to understand because they've made up their mind for, for whatever reason. Um, the next question, oh, thank you, you're, you're welcome. I've enjoyed this. Uh, I was wondering if you can share the challenges in equity pedagogy in the US when states decide curriculum and can greatly vary in their legislation. You know, there probably is no better example of challenges um, in equity pedagogy than I think many of you might be aware of the Mexican American study situation in Tucson, Arizona. It made headlines in 20, particularly around 2010 when it was banned, right? And it was the Mexican American studies program that was banned, not the African American studies, not the others that were geared toward other ethnicities and races. So in this particular situation, we see that it wasn't this, the state decided, right, that they couldn't, and the, the courts decided that that was a violation of the first and 14th amendment because a student brought the lawsuit, right? Teachers couldn't sue. They, they wouldn't have a leg to stand on for this, but the students were the ones that brought this and the courts decided in their fa favor. If we look right now at the state of Arizona, once again, where they are one of those states that has in law that teachers cannot teach divisive subjects, that they cannot use stereotyping on and on and on. A lot of this language was just cut and paste um, because of the think tanks. So the superintendent of public instruction have, has the authority to say, well, how do we interpret this? And you can see that in her document, she says culturally relevant pedagogy is absolutely appropriate, right? So the challenges in equity pedagogy really varies as your question points out, right? By the state, but it also varies in the interpretation of the state. I can say, for example, Utah, that state public, um, state superintendent of public instruction engaged with constituents and said, this is what we mean by making sure all children th thrive. This is my definition of equity. Who is against this? And she phrased it in such a way that it was very clear this was for every child, right? So she engaged and defined it and kind of took back power in this situation to be able to engage in some of this. So um, there are many challenges. They depend on the demographics, on you know, the particular governors of the state. So we have some examples, Florida, Arizona, Texas, with the whole masking situation. It's very contentious, right? But we're also seeing quite a bit of engagement with the courts to try to decipher some of this and what can and can't be done. Um, there are many challenges and this is not the last time we've seen them. So it's engaging and understanding. And really, I'm gonna go back to one of the points I made earlier about understanding history, when I say that, that includes understanding gerrymandering, understanding redlining, right? Understanding how we got to now and how the voice of a majority can be silenced by whoever's in power. One example, again, in Arizona, I used to be in Arizona, is voters voted for Proposition 208 that would give funding back to classrooms and unilaterally the governor is ignoring it or they, he had appointed people in the court and the court upheld his decision to not honor that vote, that voters initiative. So again, it's a very difficult question to answer um, given how much variation there is, but knowledge is, is power in understanding all of this. Um, next question is how can educators at all levels feel comfortable continuing to engage in equity-based pedagogy in states where their careers are now endangered by anti-CRT legislation? I, you know, wonderful question. Comfortable? I doubt they're comfortable. People and educators who are committed to social justice understand that this is a pendulum that will continue to swing and try to thwart their efforts. And once they've been engaged, they know that these efforts are going to come again. We have seen it time and time again. The strategies we're seeing right now were occurring after Brown v. Board when people did not want integration. We're seeing it again, right? And so, uh, you know, as far as how can they feel comfortable, it's not about comfort. It's about knowing what or who they need to engage with. And one of the pieces of, of advice I was given, um, this was Ian Haney Lopez's advice, is to engage the ACLU, right? This becomes a, a situation where if educators are at threat of losing their careers, it's the teachers' unions that they need to engage and the ACLU, because this is where the courts need 
to intervene since this is an issue that can't be um, taken care of by, by just teachers or, or educators or parents, right? Um, the courts need to get involved. And the next question is, can we skip implicit bias and just teach asset-based pedagogy, change behavior to change beliefs? This is a fascinating question. And it's one that I encountered quite a bit in some of the research I had been doing where the belief particularly held by um, many desegregation scholars actually, that you learn, like if you do it, then you learn and you just learn to do it that way. Um, and, and the problem I see with this strategy about just teaching asset-based pedagogy, okay, if we teach people about history and all this other knowledge, we are not explicitly teaching them about the implicit biases that they would have otherwise had, right? That is okay. Um, I don't think people need to learn that our brains work in such a way that we, you know, develop these implicit biases. However, in my work with educators, I have been told that when I cover this particular part on how our brains work, how we develop biases becomes very compelling to people who don't understand why people would think that they would have biases. This is where a lot of us think, well, other people are biased, but I'm not biased. And this key fallacy, right, does need to be dealt with. So can you just teach asset-based pedagogy? Yes, and you can change behavior to change beliefs, but I wanna be clear that when we say asset-based pedagogy, in all of that literature, whether it's Gloria Latson Billings, whether it is Antonia Darder, um, whether it is Frere, there is knowledge right, that needs to be developed that goes along with the behavior. Um, it is not ask your students about their life at home so you, you can incorporate, you can ask that in a deficit way if you don't um, learn about asset-based pedagogy in a way that really develops that essential knowledge. So I hope I've answered that question. And it looks like that is the last one in Mentimeter. And there's some comments. Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh no, that's great. Um, I think there was one last question that just kind of came up uh, like a minute ago. Uh, I could read it out. Yes, please. Cool. So this person asked, how do we incur, oh, there, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, David, I think David put it on there. Oh, he did? I was yep. looking it through the chat. Uh, how do we make sure that teachers actually teach apply CRT asset-based pedagogy and that their teachings are not entwined with personal ideologies? Uh, you know, this is a wonderful question because this, this is a, an argument that can very often be used to thwart the very kind of teaching that should take place. Um, if, if I were to be told that my teaching students about issues of race is part of my ideology, it is part of my belief system, but I shared with you all some citations of a meta-analysis, like we know research supports teaching those things, right? So the question might be, what do we mean by, by ideologies? I, I know that there is often a lot of fear um, that we're trying to be objective. And in literature outside of educational psychology that I was not exposed to until I started doing the research that I do is teaching is an act of politics. If you choose not to engage in politics, you are being political, you are siding, you are being ideological, right? And so when we're saying that teachers are actually teaching, applying not CRT, but asset-based pedagogy or culturally relevant teaching or pedagogy, personal ideologies are beliefs devoid, I'm, I'm defining it here, devoid of research to support that they are sharing knowledge that students should have. Right. And because this argument is consistently made, and, and I'll use another anecdote because I think it's an important one. So I shared with you all the Powell memo 
And one of the most powerful pair of individuals are the Koch brothers who through their philanthropy and dark money funded what became known as freedom institutes or freedom centers in many institutions. This included Arizona State University, University of Arizona. There are many across the US. Many of you may be at an institution that has one of these freedom centers, right? And their entire agenda was to push through and argue that there always had to be another side. So when I was trying to engage in trying to disseminate information about what we know about the teacher shortage or why you know, teachers are leaving the classroom, why one school district found themselves starting the school year with a shortage of 3,000 teachers at the beginning of the school year, the argument I would get from government relations at the institution was, well, but education is political, so you need to have somebody to present a counterpoint, right? I, I want us to be very mindful that when, when we are talking about evidence-based, think tanks have churned out quite a bit of evidence that is not entirely based on the, the best methodology because it's skewed, it's biased, it does not present um, what we would deem to be something that is peer reviewed. And so we need to be very careful because the whole notion of personal ideologies is a very, very slippery slope. I'm not saying that I endorse a teacher standing up in front of a, a classroom and saying, I hope you all are, are voting or your parents are all voting for Biden and Harris this year. Inappropriate, I think inappropriate, right? But teaching students about history, teaching students about what actually happened, having them think critically and engaging in this discussion, totally appropriate, right? So telling people what to think, I think is where we draw the line. We shouldn't tell people what to think. We should, when we're engaging in asset-based practices, we show them the evidence and they develop. So let's think of Harold Rugg, right? He wanted students to engage in critical problems to solve issues of society, right? He didn't want to feed them the answers. He wanted them to engage and come up with these responses, not being fed. So I, my, my rambling kind of led me to, we make sure that teachers are defaulting on presenting information, seeing students' strengths, doing all of the things that we know that they should be doing and having the students engage in these discussions, right? Not telling them what to think. I, I think that would be the answer for that one. Dr. Lopez, thank you so much. We are so very happy that you could join us today. Thank you everybody, this is great.